So again, my name is Mark Thomas. I'm the Vice President of Marketing for RideSell. We are a uh, iVentures funded company. We're in San Francisco, about 50 people right now. And I'm here to talk about mobility as a service. I'm particularly excited because we're one of the only companies that has mobility as a service platform that's designed for automotive OEMs who want to do car sharing or who want to do ride sharing or who want to do both. So we are specialists in some market stats and trends before we jumped into a bit about the, the platform. We saw in the, 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 the same quote exactly uh, in terms of the 66% of the world's population is going to be living in urban centers in the Drive Now presentation as well. This is a UN statistic. And I think this is one of the things that we all understand that is driving the move to mobility as a service. The fact that most of the world's population is going to be moving into these urban centers. But what we didn't talk about this morning was the fact that most of this population growth is going to be coming from Asia and Africa. The green bars are Asia, and the, on the left side, the, the gray bars are the, really the, the growing African market for these urban centers. And in the same way that when 2G wireless cell phone connectivity came out, uh, most of us in the developing world thought about it as landline replacements. Well, for many parts of the world that never got their landline, they just went straight into having mobile connectivity as their way to connect. So now we're looking at, especially in these developing economies, people who don't necessarily have the luxury of owning a car because it's too expensive and essentially are using the public transportation infrastructure. These are the folks that may be actually the first to be onboarded onto mobility as a service to find that it's much less expensive in the future to be able to use transportation as a service mode. So we're all talking about, wow, what are we going to do with all the free parking spaces, building urban parks? But in other parts of the world which don't have this luxury, that's where some of the true transformation is going to take place. Valley, uh, our offices are right across the street from Uber. We've, uh, we're very conscious of the money that's flowing in. And in fact, it's going to take a lot of money and a lot of big data to build up the infrastructure that we need to create mobility as a service. We're going to need smart networks, vehicle connectivity. We're going to need platforms, almost like an operating system, for car sharing and ride sharing. And we're going to need autonomous to truly change the economics. If you take a look at some of the funding that companies have got, new mobility startups have received a little over $21 billion of capital infusion. And the lion's share of those have gone to Didi and have gone to Uber. And if you look temporally, you can see that most of this investment has taken place over the last 18 months. These cars have, all, these companies have a lot of visibility, but the time to market leadership hasn't been that long. We believe that there will still be yet another transformation and another opportunity for the automotive OEMs to jump in and actually leapfrog the, the companies that are out there today. And what's, what's, well, it's the dramatic shift that's enabled by autonomous cars. So we're at the crux of two different industry changes. The first is the mobility as a service. The companies that we all looked at that are getting all the money, they're certainly investing in autonomous, but they're, the products they have today are services with drivers in them. So it's essentially a service where they don't own the vehicles, they've got drivers, and it's a relatively expensive proposition if we're looking at these as vehicle replacements. If we're just trying to think of these as, hey, I need to go downtown, I'd like to take an Uber and not have to worry about parking, that's sort of the first world view of ride sharing. But the economics, when we, when we look ahead, and realize that the cost of offering mobility as a service, 70, 80% of that cost is to pay the driver. If you take the driver out of the equation and you start to offer a service today that's estimated at about a dollar a mile 
as the cost of doing this, you can get down to something like 35 cents a mile by 2022. And that, at that price point, the economics change. This, is, this becomes the cheaper alternative to owning by a long shot. And as I think we went through this transformation with the music industry, I mean, at some point we realized we don't actually have to own those CDs. I have a big box of them in the garage, and I'm still wondering what I do with these things because now I subscribe to Spotify. So anything I want to listen to, it's there on demand. And my view of consuming music is, you know, Spotify is the one I'm writing the check to. And the, the traditional players, actually Apple, which was the one that was truly proponing, hey, buy your music, buy your music, they even realized, hey, we have to give up a big part of that business and move to the subscription business because that's where the money is. And now we look back and we see all the, essentially the CD stores have closed. There's a small niche market for uh, records that's resurgent. But by and large, music, the way we own music has transformed into a subscription service. And with automotive industry, we're at that same influx. When it becomes cheaper for us to just be able to on-demand have a vehicle when we want it, you know, the idea that do we really like having to have our cars washed and maintained and insured and uh, using all that space to store them when we're not using them 96% of the time? So that's the, the economic driver, the mobility as a service plus autonomous that come together to make truly a transformative experience. And so it's going to be about ride sharing. It's going to be about car sharing. It's going to be about integrating with public transit, which is still one of the most efficient ways of getting people around. So having an experience that we call sort of multidimensional or the ability to have car sharing and ride sharing is an important piece of this. So if the profits in the music industry were shifting from the record labels into the music subscription companies, then it seems like that we're in a situation where the profits in the transportation business or the automotive business end up being with the company that has the direct relationship with the customer. And so as automotive OEMs, do you really necessarily want to give up that control to an Uber? Uh, there's big money going into investing in the competition, 300 million from Volkswagen into their ride-sharing service, half a billion from GM. Companies are writing big checks to get the technology so that they can participate and have their own direct-to-consumer experience. So we're witnessing these automakers and, and transit organizations that are making huge investments to try and get in this market. Uh, we just saw the whole Reach Now experience from BMW, who have been one of the pioneers in having an automotive OEM build a brand uh, essentially from scratch in North America and be very successful in doing it. So our is that the time to act is now, that get out there and establish a relationship with customers directly. Establish a brand. There, there is a platform that exists <coughs> which will create multi-dimensional car sharing and ride sharing that allows you to really add your brand and bring a fleet of vehicles and you can enter a market. There are first mover advantages that are waiting to happen. And I know every car company has their own mobility strategy. They're paying, uh, you know, insourcing and having consulting firms and figuring out how to build this. And I think a lot of the companies don't even realize that there is an existing platform that they can use today to get out and have a multi-dimensional ride-sharing experience. And this is one that allows car companies to, to put fleets of cars out as car shares and then use that same fleet, just adding drivers, to offer ride-sharing. And if there's, there's more demand for ride-sharing, they can just put more drivers into their, their car sharing fleet and switch people over. So there's flexibility between the ability to, to use the assets of the cars that are out on the streets and then having the ability to uh, also refer customers. If, you, if uh, you can't just put new drivers in the system seamlessly, but you can say, look, it's a 12-minute wait to get your next ride 
there's a car parked around the corner. Would you like to drive yourself there? Having a single integrated experience that lets people choose amongst driving there, getting a ride there, or actually even, as they showed in the, the BMW presentation, referring people to public transit so that your ride, if you want to go from A to B, it'll actually take you from A to the tram station or from A to the train station, creating an experience that's much more about multimodal and offering more value add to your customer base. So what we do is an app. I mean, somebody talked about, do you guys invest in apps? The app is the tip of the iceberg. It's about the end-to-end -end service that you need to power ride-sharing and car-sharing. And it's not just ride-sharing, car-sharing, but there's also carpooling, an incredible piece, because just having one person in the car isn't the most efficient way. Being able to have and understand that, that multiple people can get in the car. And in fact, cars themselves can have resources associated with them. Like, do you have a bike? Multimodal transportation. Well, you need a car with a bike rack. Well, guess what? Being able to categorize that and say, yeah, I'll get you a car with a bike rack in the same way that you may want to say, I'll get you a car that, that works with a wheelchair. Or I'll get you a car that has a child seat in it because you have a child that needs one and you don't want to be carrying your child seat around with you. So what we do is we offer the full integrated end -to end experience with things like onboarding. We can onboard a new customer onto your service in less than five minutes. Uh, and that's state of the art. There's a company that just moved into the San Francisco Bay Area. It takes about two weeks to get validated to use their cars. We have some proprietary technology that really allows people to just download the app, take a picture of their driver's license, take a picture of their credit card, have all of those things verified, and be up and running in roughly about four minutes. And that's huge because that means your customers aren't fleeing because, oh, I want, it, I want the car now, and we're used to everything being instant. Why isn't the onboarding process instant? You can also do the same thing for drivers because once you get into the ride-sharing business, you realize recruiting drivers is work. And if you can use that same thing to onboard a new driver in less than 10 minutes, that also lets you grow your base of drivers quickly. Dispatch is one of those things that people uh, think is just, well, okay, you've got a request, you find the nearest car, and you match it up. But there's a huge amount of big data analytics that goes into figuring out how you do dispatching. Because the, the metric that most of the customers care about is how long before the thing get, gets me. So trying to optimize dispatch to make sure that the ride gets there in as short amount of time as possible is science. And it definitely takes deep network analytics to figure out how to optimize the fleet you have to make sure that the, the customers have the best experience. Things like revenue, being able to set dynamic pricing based on certain business rules, being able to collect the money. That's all stuff that gets taken care of too. Management. Of course, anything, being able to do real-time uh, analysis of your situation, as well as sort of after-the-fact analytics to figure out heat maps. So when your drivers are idle, if you can predict where the next ride is going to be requested from, why don't you send them there ahead of time? Again, focusing on making sure that the customer experience is the best to have the shortest wait time from when they need a ride to when they can get it. And then finally, things like just maintenance. Guess what? The, the, the electric car's battery is low. Well, then there's companies that, that condition your fleet. Being able to understand the, the individual state, does this car have damage? Is it dirty? Does it need to be washed? Is it out of gas? Is it out of a charge? And sending those notifications to the people that condition the fleet means that your product will always represent a superior experience. Many reasons to have this interim car sharing experience is to get customers inside your vehicles, have them realize these are great cars. They're essentially paying for a test drive in some instances. And like before, we saw people excited about driving an electric car, driving an i3. This is something that, as auto OEMs, that you can do. So at RideSell, this isn't just a future platform. I'm not here uh, at TechCrunch talking about what we can do in, in two years, uh, it's something that we've done already. And in fact, the Reach Now system that was talked about, that's entirely powered by uh, our ride-sell platform. So they've been great partners with us 
uh, and are absolutely uh, encouraging us uh, and being supportive of our opening this platform up to uh, other automotive OEMs. In the same way that the here company was bought by Volkswagen, was bought by Daimler and BMW, we're in a world now where not everyone can write $500 million checks to own the asset. And it's probably not the most efficient thing because if you work with a platform company that powers multiple different networks, you actually get the network effect of all the machine learning that happens with everybody's can go into making the experience better and stronger. We also, I've talked a lot about automotive OEMs because that's really the focus of this show. Um, we have customers in Silicon Valley who use the dispatching and the driver and the client to uh, automate pickups between their corporate campuses. Uh, two very large um, companies in Silicon Valley with big campuses are using our technology and have both uh, cars that are in a pool that people can just get in the same way you can grab a bicycle and take it, and uh, shuttles that will take you from point to point. In fact, they're even using our technology to set up kiosks so that you just walk up, say, need a ride, tap it, and the, the driver comes and picks you up. So corporate campuses uh, were being used by college campuses for safe ride. Again, optimizing for you know shuttles. And additionally, we're working with some transit agencies. In this case, Southwest Transit's been working with us for about a year, and they've seen their ridership with the same fleet go up roughly 600%. So a superior app experience, an incredible dispatch, uh, and all the technology by a company that's been around since 2009 um, just focused on this. The company itself had a ride-sharing product called Summon. Uh, we've got about 15 million rides serviced, and the team of 50, you know, I'd say more than half of them have deep industry experience in this field. So we'd love to be partnering with you, uh, automotive OEMs, to, to really help you get into the market. Uh, it could take a matter of months, not years, to use a ready-made platform. So we're RideSell. Thank you.